Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Mike LaPon from Symphony X and Mike LaPon's Silent Assassins. And you're listening to the Aftershocks podcast. Prepare yourself to be blown away by the seismic sounds and scrutiny of... Aftershocks podcast with Chris Aiken and Matt Hartnett. Aftershockspodcast.com. And that, of course, was a little bit of the song Ides of March that from the album Whore of Babylon. And on the line right now is the creator of that song. And uh, you probably know him from Silent Assassins or certainly from Symphony X. He is the bassist of both. It is Mr. Mike LePon. Mike, how are you, man? I'm um, doing great, man. How you doing, Chris? I'm good, man. It is it is good to speak to you. I I, I know you don't know this, but we have a mutual friend in Miss um, Veronica Freeman. Oh yes, she's a very very dear friend. Oh, so that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Tell her I said hello. <laughs> I will definitely do that. She is a she's a good friend to both, and I hear your name a lot when I speak to her. So it's um. It's good to speak to you on those terms. It's also good to speak to you. I can't believe I've never interviewed you before, being that I am a diehard Symphony X guy. I, I love the band, but but it's one of those things that every time there's interviews for Symphony X, it's either it's either Michael or it's uh, Russell that do, that does them all. So I've never run across you before. Yeah, yeah, they do all the interviews. So yeah, so I could totally understand that. But thanks for being a uh... Thanks for being a big fan. We really appreciate it. Absolutely, man. Well, we're not here to talk Symphony X, though. We're ta- we're here to talk this new this new um, release from your Silent Assassins. What a what a great metal release. I guess that's the best way to put it. You know, I I think a lot of people probably come into Silent Assassins with some expectation because obviously because of the Symphony X tie in. But man, this thing is just a straight up metal powerful release man yeah and you know that's uh that was the idea you know the the reason i started doing this project is um well one of the reasons um is because you know being the bass player for symphony x uh everybody kind of just pigeonholed me as a progressive metal bass player sure and <clears throat> And although I love doing that kind of music and uh, it's so much fun and it made me a, a better player, um, it's not really where I came from, you know. So my my influences were always uh, hard rock and heavy metal, you know. Sure. Um, so I had all these influences and uh, I decided that I, I, you know, I wanted to show my fans where I come from and where my influences began. Because I always, you know, obviously I grew up, as you can hear from listening to the record, you know, on Priest and Maiden and Sabbath and Metallica and the whole, the whole list. Right. Um, and, um, 
you know, I just wanted people to hear uh, where I came from. And, um, and also, you know, I, I wanted to just really bring back the feeling that I used to have when I first listened to Metallica, when I first listened to Priest or Merciful Fate or something, you know, that, that adrenaline rush that you first get and you hear that guitar riff crashing in. I just wanted to really recreate that uh, as best I can for the fans of the younger generation. And, and for the older generation, you guys should probably feel comfortable with just hearing that, that sound again. Sure. Now, now you, you called it a project. Is it a project or is it now, you know, three albums in and almost 10 years in is <laughs> it, has it become a band of its own? Um, you know, I still call it a project, you know, because I really haven't done, uh, I haven't really done any touring or anything like that. It's just, you know, when I have time, you know, let's say if Symphony X is off the road or I'm not doing anything else, then, you know, like I dive into it, you know, it's kind of like my, you know, my baby and I, I, I love doing it. It's a, it's a great outlet for me. And, um, you know, I mean, maybe in the future at some point, it could go uh, into something else, but uh, right now, it, you know, it is what it is, and I, I love doing it, and I, and I love uh, it. Really puts me back in touch with my past and where I came from, and it just it feels really good for the soul. Absolutely. Well, well, Mike, let let's talk a little bit about this release. It's you know, as we mentioned, it's definitely metal, and I don't know because I, I'll be honest, I didn't dig fully fully into the lyrics but i don't know is if this is so much of a concept record as it is like conceptualized songs so maybe maybe take me through it a little bit and help me understand if if i'm looking at a concept that i just haven't grasped yet or if it is just song to song just individual concepts yeah uh it's uh each song has its own concept and that's kind of um this is the uh, third album I've done. And, um, that's how it's always kind of been. Like each song has its own little story to tell its own little concept. And, um, you know, that, that was another, I guess that was another thing that allowed me to finally start moving forward and, and doing solo stuff because, um, you know, in my early days, you know, I liked writing music, but I didn't really know what to write lyrics about back in, you know, when I was younger, because, you know, I just didn't want to write about like, you know, hot chicks and stuff like that. It's just, right. to me, it's like kind of cheesy, but, um, I'd say probably around 15 years ago or so, I really started to read to get into history, you know, and I started to really love history and mythology and all this stuff. I was, I got really addicted to the history channel, you know, on, uh, on cable TV and, I learned so much and then I put the two and two together. I was like, wow, you know, metal is so epic. It would just make sense to have lyrics that from like either history or mythology or something that would match it. And, um, and that, and then I really started to write because then I had the lyric, uh, foundation going. So, um, you know, and then I put all that together and then, uh, here I am. Uh, so, so what do you do specifically? Do you write to concept or do you write music and then come up with words to fit the concept? Oh yeah, that's a great question. You know, in the early days, again, I, I always had the music first and I always thought, well, you know, that's what you have to do. You have to write, you know, this, these bunch of riffs and then you put lyrics to it. Um, and I did that for a long time, but then I recently, discovered that if you write the lyrics first, whether it be, um, whether it be just a poem or an outline or the actual lyrics, if you do that first, you could actually tailor the music to the feel of the lyrics. You know, if, 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 uh, the lyrics at one point start to get sad, you can write a sad part. If they get dark, you could write a dark part and you can make, each lyric like a like a little mini movie right. and um i had never really discovered that until um i started writing with symphony x because they were the first ones that really uh opened my mind to that um 
but I I do both on this album. There are some songs that, <clears throat> you know, I had the music first, and then I put some lyrics to it that I had. Uh, and then there's also things where uh, I had some lyrics lying around, and I and I decided I want to write some some music tailored to these lyrics. So I think. I think a band should do both because it'll kind of force you to be creative in different ways. <laughs> I I swear, Mike, I hate you creative guys that you can actually work that way. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I used to back in a, a long, long time ago when I too thought I was going to be a musician, I used to try and write songs and, oh man, I could never, I could never n- do it without structure. I, with, with, where you have like a looser structure, it always had to be, okay, here's the song. Now wedge the words together, which I guess is why I'm doing interviews now instead of writing songs. <laughs> well, you know, it is, it's, it's definitely challenging. So I, I could totally understand that. And, uh, you know, it just takes a lot of, especially if you've got lyrics and you want to write music to it, that actually takes a lot of time. And, you know, and you want to try to make, everything kind of flow and it's sometimes it's even like torture, but it's just something that you just love and you, you just have to do it. So (laughs) (laughs) makes sense. Well, well, Mike, the, the one thing that stands out, I am certainly aware of your career. I'm certainly aware of Alan's career. Uh, I didn't know much. In fact, I really didn't know anything about Lance or, or Rod as guitar players. But geez, these guys blaze, man. Where where did you find these guys? Yeah, you know, it's <clears throat> it's uh, one of those things. It's uh, it's a shame because there's so many musicians out there that that are just so great, and if they don't get on a, a release that's kind of well known, you wouldn't hear from them, you know. Mm-hmm. So, um, as far as Lance Barnwald goes. Um, He's a young guy. He's like uh, 23, 24 years old. And um, I kind of met him through Ross the Boss. Okay. And uh, because he was kind of like a a family friend. And I found out that, you know, Symphony X was his favorite band. So um, I started talking to him and I, I loved the way he played because even though he was younger, he had he could play, he could shred like the new school guys, but he had the, uh, he had the feel of the old school guys. Right. And I thought that was, uh, very unique. So I really wanted to work with him. And, um, so he did, uh, he did my second solo album, uh, and he did so well that I wanted to bring him on for the third solo album. So, um, yeah, he's a fantastic guitar player and great, great guy. Uh, and Rod Rivera, Rod Rivera is a little closer to my age. Um, and I had just jammed with him in various other projects. Like, uh, I'm in a band with, uh, a separate band with Rod called Bed Risen. Okay. And, uh, if it's, uh, it's like a, it's kind of like old rainbow meets Testament. If you could imagine that, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> um, so I'd known Rod for years and, What's cool about Rod is his dad uh, was a professional flamenco guitar player. So he grew up with that influence. And then when you put that together with his love for like Richie Blackmore and, uh, and the metal guys, it gave him a really unique kind of style. So um, I, uh, you know, when, when, when I have some songs that I think might fit Rod's style, I'll ask him to do a lead. Uh, when I have some songs that I think fit Lance's style, I'll ask him to do a lead. Um, so it's, you know, it's really cool to have these, uh, these great guitar players around. And I hope that both of these guys, uh, become more known because I think they really need to be known by the world. Sure. And, and, and I cannot say enough about the, the soloing, which I'm assuming is mostly Lance. My God, there is some blazing <laughs> solos on, on this new whore of Babylon record. Yeah, Lance, um, you know, he was very influenced by, uh, you know, by just everybody. And he, so uh, he he does some really sick solos. I mean, really, really awesome. And what's cool is like in some of the solos, he does really like 
super shredding stuff that sound amazing. And then I have one song that's just kind of like a, a classic metal kind of Man of War song where he just does a really nice bluesy kind of uh, old school kind of uh, solo. So he's so versatile sure. and uh, I love what he's doing. And uh, he's totally into, uh, he loves the silent assassins and he always wants to do more stuff. And uh, so I'm really blessed to have him on board. Absolutely. Now, uh, you know, your, your singer, of course, is Alan Tessio, who, um, who, or Alan Tecchio, who has obviously had a long career, whether it's Seven Witches or certainly Hades. Those records are untouchable <laughs> to me. But um, yeah. it's interesting on this release. I think you really, I don't know if you did it on purpose or it's the way it came out or what, but you really challenged him to find some different sound. And I'll point to like Telltale Heart as the specific example. I've never heard him sound like that before. And it's, it's really cool to see somebody that's been around for such a long time, adjust what they do. Yeah. And it's amazing that you say that because if you interview with him, he will probably tell you just that, um, the exact, he'll probably give you the song too, right okay. to the song. Um, yeah, you know, um, Alan has told me many times, well, you know, first of all, if you're a singer, it makes it really difficult when you're trying to sing songs that are written by other people. Like in The Silent Assassins, what I do is, besides writing the music, I'll give Alan my vocal melodies. Okay. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll make a demo of the songs, and then I'll actually sing the songs and give him a demo of it. Now I can't sing to save my life. So he'll, he'll hear what I'm trying to do. And mm -hmm. then he'll, you know, he'll do, he'll sing the way it's supposed to sound, you know? Right. So, um, but you know, obviously if I'm hearing these melodies, it might be things that, or ways of, or techniques of singing that maybe he's never attempted, you know? So he, uh, he definitely has, you know, a tough job ahead of him when he records these records. And, um, specifically with that song, Telltale Heart, he did mention that he said, you know, this was one of the, uh, you know, for him, it was something that he really, uh, had to really work on mm -hmm. because it was not something that he was used to. So it's amazing that you could pick that out. But, um, you know, a lot of times I'll hear stuff vocal wise and maybe it's just the consonants when you're singing, you know, that I don't get that, it, you know, maybe it's hard to sing. So, but he does it and he pulls it off every time. And, uh, I, you know, I, I was always a big fan of Alan throughout the years and he's a, uh, you know, he's, he's a local guy here too in the New York, New Jersey area. So sure. he's always close by and we get to work together and, uh, awesome guy, awesome singer. And, you know, he just made the album explode yeah he's he's a phenomenal singer i i've 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 known him and dan lorenzo for forever with the through the hades days so i certainly am well aware yeah. of him and that's why i think that's probably why that song popped out at me because i was listening i literally was listening to it and i went to the to the promo stuff to see if you had another singer because oh I was, I, I, I was like, this can't, you know, it's, he's such a smooth high guy. You know, he's like that, what, you know, that, yeah. that thing. Yeah. And then to hear kind of that gravelly thing, I was like, I don't think he's ever done that before. Yeah. And he, uh, he's told that to me in the past. He's, he said, you know, in Haiti's days, he was always, a, you know, just real uh, straight high singer. Right. And, um, and then for, you know, with the silent assassin stuff, if you, you know, if you go back and listen to the, uh, all three albums, you'll hear that his vocals are very like, um, rough and gritty. Mm -hmm. And, uh, he goes high when he has to, it's, it's, he sounds great. He's got a, he's got so, such an attack to it. Sure. He definitely does. Now, now, um, Mike, the, Certainly, and, and I, I know you're aware of this, but you know, a lot of people may not be aware of it if they don't go all the way back with Symphony X. The last couple of records of Symphony X have been far more metal than the early mm. stuff. You know, they, they really have been heavier. They've been, I don't know if that's, 
your influence or if Michael Romeo just wants to play that way more or Russell or who it is that's that's taking it or probably all of you guys taking it that way mm-hmm. because of right. that does that um does that leave you sometimes thinking when you have an idea well maybe I shouldn't take this to this band I should keep it for that band or or do you do you just kind of write on the fly and what what you have at the moment is what you have at the moment yeah, you know, when I when I write stuff, you know, I'll write stuff at my house, you know, when I'm just comfortable and, and, and uh, just chilling out. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when I write a riff, I'll kind of know right away. I was like, well, okay, this sounds like something that Symphony X might do, you know, or this sounds like something that Silent Assassins might do, or maybe this sounds something like Ross the Boss might do. I'll kind of know right away, you know, sure. so I'll just kind of just jam on whatever and then whatever comes out, uh, comes out. But, uh, yeah, definitely the last couple of Symphony X records, uh, have been much heavier. And, um, yeah, I think, uh, it's kind of just like a natural progression, you know, for the band, you know, I think, uh, Romeo's just getting into writing heavier and heavier stuff. Right. And now, and now he's like, his writing now is like super heavy. And now he's, putting like heavy dark orchestration into it so it's really um sounding cool that's cool so so i take it that that means that at some point we are going to get another symphony x record yes um we uh uh, we have a we definitely have another record that we have to do for nuclear blast as part of our contract so i mean definitely is going to come so what we talked about was you know after um all this virus stuff is over. We're going to get together and we're going to start writing, uh, another Symphony X record. Okay. Very good. Cause I, I, I just know you guys are right at that, that kind of limit (laughs) that you guys always get to you guys. guys, Yeah. It's funny. I I've interviewed Russell a bunch of times and every time Russell says the same thing, it's not going to take as long until before the next (laughs) Symphony X record. And then it gets to be three years, four Uh, years, five years. And then another one comes. And I know underworld was what about five years ago was when, was when we had underworld. So, you know, Uh, yeah, unfortunately I think this time we're going to, break all our records because <laughs> you know it's like you know it's like uh especially with this uh virus thing it kind of threw us off now so now i mean you're looking minute you know you're looking at definitely 2021 for sure, sure definitely now you obviously are affected like everybody else is like literally everybody on the entire planet is with this right. with this virus mm-hmm. I have to imagine for someone like you that works in a lot of bands and does a lot of production and works with a lot of people, this has to be making you absolutely stir crazy. No. Oh yeah. I mean, it, it was uh, very interesting for on a personal perspective because I had just literally had just moved into a new home in early March. Oh wow. And then, and I figured, you know what we got, I got a Ross, I got a Symphony X tour coming up in the U.S. I got a Ross the Boss tour in Europe. I was like, I'll be good for money. I'm doing well. And then boom, right. <laughs> you know? Um, so all those tours get postponed. And I'm like, oh, okay. So I got to figure out how to pay the bills somehow. Right. Um, so, uh, you know, but um, besides that, yeah, I'm definitely going stir crazy. And there's no question about it. Um, and I've just been, you know, I, I, I'd say probably like within the last week or so, I've just been saying to myself, man, I'm just going to go out of the house and live my life, man. You know, yeah. cause I'm not going to, I'm not going to just sit here and, and just rot, you know? So, uh, and of course, you know, I've been on the musical end, you know, I've been writing, uh, songs and keeping myself busy. I've been giving some lessons and stuff. So I've been trying to keep myself busy, but you really, there's, you know, you really can't keep yourself that busy to, right. you know, for a whole day. <laughs> right. Yeah. There's only so much Netflix or YouTube anybody can stare at. Right. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. You know. <laughs> I get it, man. Well, um, uh, Mike, let, let me just ask you real quick, you know, this is just, it doesn't really pertain specifically to the release sure. or symphony X or anything, but I, I've always been curious with you guys with symphony X rather symphony mm-hmm. X always has been regarded as prog metal darlings. I know you know that. And, 
And and mm-hmm. in a way, you know, if you guys show up at Prague Power as an example, you're the headliner, and that's great. You get a lot of acclaim. At the right. same time, I've always look, looked at that as just a bad stigma because the first pe- thing people do is say, must sound like Dream Theater. I don't like Dream Theater. I'm not going to listen to it. Do, do you see, you know, as somebody in the band, have you have you seen that? And do you, and, and I'm certainly not smashing on Dream Theater, although they're not my favorite I band. I don't, I don't really understand the comparison because you guys are so much more metal than Dream Theater yeah. ever was. Has that caused you, do you think, to not have fans from of the band that really probably mm-hmm. would be fans if 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 they didn't get thrown together. Mm-hmm. That's a fantastic question, bro. Um, yeah, uh, it it had being pigeonholed as a progressive metal band. I think has uh, cost us a lot of fans. Uh, and for just exactly what you said, they'd be like, well, you know, the only progressive metal band they know mm-hmm. is Dream Theater. Right. And they say, well, all right, you know, I don't like Dream Theater, so, you know, I'm not going to listen to these guys. And I agree with you. I don't think we sound anything like no. Dream Theater at all, you know? So, um, and, you know, since I, I mean, I joined the band in 1999, and I swear to you that, um, for the whole time from 1999 to now, we have gotten compared to dream theater. Right. And, um, it seems like that's the only band we get compared to now, as you say, you know, we think our music can cross over into prog fans and to heavy metal fans, Sure, you know, because I, you know, I think our stuff is super heavy and, and I mean, the, it's really not all that progressive, you know, in the, in the early years of the band, I could kind of understand it, but since, um, I'd say for the last, uh, at least for the last, uh, let's see, I would say when did paradise Lost come out around 2007. All right. So I'd say for the last 13 years, the stuff has really not been that progressive. It's been more metal and heavy. Mm-hmm. Um, but, um, yeah, that's always a problem. We always get compared to dream theater. And, um, I guess it's just something that, uh, will never change. Probably. And, uh, you know, so, I mean, it, it is what it is. We just accept it now, but I mean, we think that we can play, uh, on a tour with, uh, dream theater or Megadeth, you know, right. either one. Absolutely. Well, one record that's definitely not going to get compared to Dream Theater is this new one. It's called Whore of Babylon. It is Michael <laughs> Pond's Silent Assassins. And I'll tell you what, Mike, why don't you uh, pick a track um, for us to wrap this one up with and maybe tell people a quick story about it? Sure. Um, well, hey, why don't we do uh, why don't we do the Telltale Heart since we were just talking about it? Okay. Um, Telltale, Telltale Heart is one of my favorite tracks on the record. Um, it's one of my favorite Edgar Allan Poe stories. So I just had to write a song about it. Um, and it's one of those, uh, one of those songs that's like a mini movie and, uh, yours truly does a little cameo in the middle there, a spoken word section. So, uh, that's me. (laughs) And then, uh, and then Alan does just a crushing vocal performance on on the song. So uh, I hope you guys enjoy it. All right. Well, let's check it out right now. It is Telltale Heart. It is the Aftershocks podcast.
Thanks for listening to Aftershocks. For more episodes, go to our website at www.aftershockspodcast.com. Visit us on our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter pages for more news and information on the podcast. And be sure to subscribe, listen to, and review all episodes on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and all other podcast platforms. For your music listening pleasure, visit our website or go to www.shockwavesradio.com for all comments and questions. Please email us at info at aftershockspodcast.com.